Okay, you jump scratch, I'll watch it. What is this? Three things. It a space suit has to do three things. It has to maintain pressure, so your blood doesn't start boiling in the vacuum of space. It has to provide oxygen, so you can breathe. And it's it has audio, to protect man. against the environment. Extreme heat, extreme cold, and direct cold. This won't do any of those. It's just a replica of that one. That's the actual Sokol spacesuit that Tim Peake, the most recent British astronaut, used in space. The folks here at the National Space Centre wouldn't let me try on a real one, which is fair enough. Versions of that suit have been protecting astronauts oh, since not? the 1970s, and there are variants still used today. It's not designed for hours-long spacewalks. It's basically an emergency personal lifeboat for if the ship you're travelling on uh, springs a leak. And it provides those three things. Pressure, oxygen, environmental protection. Now, a couple of months ago, I had a video where an AI tried to suggest stories and titles that I could cover. And one of the things it came up with was the long forgotten history of the British moon landings. Not strictly true, of course, we never actually got there, but well, one of okay. the team here got in touch. And it turns out that in the 1940s, 15 years before Kennedy said that America chose to go to the moon, the British Interplanetary Society did have similar plans, including our own spacesuit. The BIS was set up in 1933 by a man called Phil Cleeter and he had this plan. He wanted to get together with like-minded individuals who were interested in spaceflight and what the possible future of spaceflight might be. Rocket technology was suddenly moving forward in a way that actually spaceflight was something tangible and might well be realistic. The BIS weren't seriously expecting to launch a mission to the moon on their own, but they did want to say, hey, we think this is possible and we think Britain should do it. And one of their number, illustrator Ralph Smith, drew up plans for a spacesuit. So we have an exhibition here at the National Space Centre that focuses on the space race, and people tend to think about America and the Soviet Union, and we wanted to tell something of what Britain was up to at the same time. As we were planning for our exhibition, we were leafing through a research document and looking at it's the cool history building, of the BIS, and immediately this picture jumped out of somebody wearing this incredible looking spacesuit that they'd designed, and immediately we like just said, well, we have to make this. It looks wonderful, but no one ever built it until a few years ago. So I get a call, uh, and where do you start? You've got two <laughs> drawings, basically. Rather than just say, well, I'll make a, a replica, a facsimile of it, I thought, let's look at the materials that were available at the time. Cotton and rubber, much like a modern spacesuit is made out of beta fabric and a rubber pressure layer inside. And the pressures inside it, it can't expand out any further. It can't balloon out. He would have an oxygen supply in his backpack there. So he's being fed this oxygen supply going through past his face, down through the suit and recycling back into the backpack again for expulsion in the way just like an Apollo suit did. Here you've got what we call the convolutes and they're to give a bit of movement at the arm. And right up here, you've got cloth of silver. If he's getting cold on the surface of the moon, he can then pull this cape around him. And now any heat that's radiating out from the suit, he can then trap that heat in and it reflects the heat back into the body again. <laughs> so these little pins here, they are in fact little standoff mushrooms. So when the cape is hanging over them, there's a gap between the surface of the suit and the surface of the cape. And that gap, a vacuum means there's no physical thermal transfer from the suit out into the vacuum of space. You'll have noticed that on the front of his chest, he's got this rather strange device here. This is an airlock. Imagine the circumstances. You're on the surface of the moon. You find an interesting rock. You open the airlock. You put the rock into the airlock. You close the airlock. Now you withdraw your arms inside the suit through these exceptionally large holes here. And using that long front, you can examine that rock that you've just taken off the lunar <laughs> surface. But you'll also notice there is a shooting stick and it gives you a walking stick come seat. You get tired on the surface of the moon, you open the seat part of the shooting stick and you, you guys, sit down. Uh, guys, they, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying that, because you know, these are smart people, you know? Because they're, because they're smart people, you know? I, I, I don't want to comment on it, but I can't help but ask, why would you want to design the rock on your stuff? I've kind of thought of everything really. So how do you build something like this and stay to those 1940s techniques? We turned to what would have been available at the time, even to this silver finish here on the helmet. And in fact, the people we went to to get this vacuum plating done, they were an original company that would have been doing the original 
if it had ever happened. And in fact, when we took the helmet into them, <laughs> they funny? said, oh, well, we've signed, we've got it, to it do it then. I didn't There's newsreel again. footage from the 1940s, which says the BIS estimated half a million pounds to send someone to the moon. In today's money, that's about 20 million. The Apollo program roughly cost the US government 10,000 times that. It's safe to say that the BIS's plans were optimistic. So how well would the British spacesuit have held up against an actual trip to the moon? We're pretty sure this would be the Mark I. If this had ever really walked on the moon, this would have been the Mark VIII, the Mark IX. Remember on the moon, you only have to pressurise up if you're breathing pure oxygen to about four and a half pounds per square inch. This easily would have been capable of taking that pressure, but it just would have been pretty immobile. You simply can't lift your arms up very high because of the nature of this deep shoulder means oh. that the arm just can't I think rise the up. Rocks, I think the BIS were very serious about going to the moon. They had nowhere near as much information as NASA would have had in the 1950s and 60s about the realities of uh, spaceflight and particularly the challenges of getting to the moon. But certainly these weren't crazy people just throwing around ideas. There was lots of really talented people. Woman. They were just nowhere near as complex in terms of the materials that they had, but they weren't available to them at the time. So who knows, had they have had the, the time and the money to develop the sort of space age materials that went into some of those later suits, more time to practice and actually do some practical experiments, then who knows, quite possibly. Thank you so much to everyone at the National Thanks, Space Centre. Well, that was pretty good, I enjoyed that.